On August 23rd, 2006, an elderly woman was startled by a knock on her kitchen window. In her garden was a young blonde woman. She was only skin and bones. Call the police, the young woman yelled through the glass, and the elderly woman did. What in the world was going on? She couldn't let this crazy woman into her home, but she also couldn't refuse her request for help. Little did she know, the police had given up on this eight-year-long case that would change the way Austrian parents viewed the safety of their children. On March 2, 1998, 10-year-old Natasha Kamposh left her mother's home in Vienna to walk to school as usual around 7 a.m. Sour and upset that they just had a fight. Why did her parents have to get a divorce? And why did her mother need to work all the time? Still, her mother always said, never leave the house angry. She debated going back to apologize and tell her mom she loved her. No, it would be fine. What could possibly go wrong? While distracted in her thoughts, she noticed a white van in her path. She considered crossing the road, but decided she was being silly and continued on her way. Shortly after, she was being pulled into the van. She tried to scream, but nothing would come out. When her daughter didn't arrive home from school, Brigitte Sierni was worried sick. She frantically called the school to see if her daughter showed up, but she hadn't. The police were called shortly after. For four days, over 130 tips were received by the Vienna police. People claimed they spotted Natasha with her mother as close as the grocery store all the way to Hungary, which wouldn't be impossible, as she would still have her papers on her from the weekend trip she'd taken with her father. Police continued to search the route she took to school, as well as the nearest ponds. A 12-year-old student contacted the police reporting seeing a girl being forced into a white van. This began the investigation of over 1,520 owners of white trucks and interrogation of 650 others. Natasha's mother, Brigitte's phone line, was tapped in hopes of a call from the kidnapper. This resulted in hoaxes and copycats who called in claiming to have her daughter and the demands of ransoms. Alas, the police were left empty-handed. In 2001, the police generated computer-rendered images of what she might have looked like and used it to compare images on illicit websites. By 2002, there were 167 files on the case. And by 2003, a private investigator was convinced that Brigitte was having an affair with a married businessman and thought her daughter was in the way. Brigitte must have murdered and buried her daughter under a pond. But after digging up the pond, he realized that Natasha was not there. With all options exhausted, the Vienna City Council informed Brigitte to buy a grave plot so she would have a place to talk to Natasha. Brigitte burst into tears at the thought. There was no way her little girl could be gone, right? What's your shoe size? Are you going to molest me? Natasha Kampusch watched a lot of late night television and the stories of kidnapped children ran through her head. Would she end up part of a human trafficking or CP ring like those children she saw on TV? No, she wasn't blonde and skinny. She was brunette and chubby. She braced herself to be just another number on the list of murdered children. You're too young for that, the captor responded. I'm bringing you to the others and I'll be done with you. But this was a lie. There weren't any others. Natasha was brought from Vienna to the nearby town of Strashof and der Norben, where her captor lived. He covered her in a blanket and dragged her into the garage, eventually pushing her into a tiny moldy cellar. When she pulled off the blanket, she was met eye to eye with her captor. He demanded she take off her shoes for him to burn and took her book bag. He was convinced she had some kind of device she could use to contact the outside world, something that would be very out of place in the 90s for a 10 year old to carry around. She begged and pleaded with him to let her go, promising that she wouldn't tell anyone and would forget his face, but he ignored her. 10 year old Natasha Kamposh was left alone in the hole to fend for herself, a single light bulb lighting the dark room. The only noise that accompanied her was the rattling of a fan blowing air from the garage into the cellar. For the first few months of her capture, Natasha was extremely bored and lonely. She relished the idea of being around her family and friends once again. The captor, a skinny reclusive man, would play board games with her and brought her books, pre-recorded TV shows, 
and a radio to occupy her time. Despite the fact that she wasn't there out of her own will, he always demanded she be thankful for whatever he brought down for her. He was using his own money after all, and she was becoming expensive. He told her that her parents no longer wanted her, so she should be grateful that he did. He eventually got tired of always cooking for her, so he provided a hot plate and some instant food to cook. The way he treated her within the first few months seemed rather kind compared to the torture he would subject her to over the years. Eventually, he began denying her meals and entertainment if she disobeyed him. The captor's mother would come over during the weekend, oblivious to the young girl in the cellar left to her own devices. During these times, he would usually give her enough to last until Monday, but when she was being disorderly, he would deprive her. As she got older, he began policing her food more, often calling her fat and having her weigh herself. Natasha began wondering if he had an eating disorder himself. He would randomly listen in on her through an intercom he had set up and called out to her if he was suspecting her of doing something she wasn't supposed to do. He would expect her to respond in excruciating details on her activities and would get angry if she refused. Obey, obey, obey. He would continuously call out, enough to drive her crazy. The mental torture of the repeated order, accompanied by the hours of darkness he would subject her to, was only the beginning. In 2000, Natasha had her period, which was also the time he decided she would be his housemaid and laborer. The kidnapper had an obsession with cleanliness and would force Natasha to clean up anything she touched so she wouldn't leave her fingerprints anywhere. He would stand behind her scolding her for doing things wrong and roughly showed her how to cook and clean properly. His obsession with hygiene moved to her hair, which he made her cover with a plastic bag to avoid getting anywhere. Eventually, he just shaved it all off. Part of being his personal laborer was assisting with renovating the upper floor of his house and going with him to help renovate apartments he would flip. Being so malnourished, having never been fed properly, made it even more difficult for her to pick up heavy bricks and lumber, causing her to make more mistakes and as a result be beaten for it. He wouldn't allow her to cry. If she did, he would grab her wrists to make her rub her eyes with the back of her hands or push her head under the sink to wash the tears away, causing her to grow up emotionally stunted. Eventually, at 17, he began pushing his ideal perfect life on her. He allowed Natasha to grow out her hair and dye it blonde. He blamed not being able to bring her outside on trips on the fact that she was disobedient. Eventually, in 2004, the abuse got to be so much that she tried to take her own life. She turned on her hot plate and burned toilet paper rolls until her dungeon was filled with smoke. When revelation struck, she realized that she wanted to live and she would survive. She quickly put out the smoke and vowed to focus harder on getting out. Natasha believes she got through such traumatic abuse by disconnecting the experiences from herself as if it was happening to someone else she was watching. She would also occasionally fight back, hitting herself until he stopped yelling or sometimes even hit him back. When he demanded she call him master or lord, she would refuse and take the beating. She was growing mentally stronger, setting up a boundary, giving her the strength to respect herself. There were a few times when Natasha could have escaped, but the timing wasn't right. The captor would sometimes bring her out to stores to pick up supplies or a treat on the rare occasion. Natasha would see a friendly face that would be willing to help her, but a voice inside her head always told her that the captor would kill everyone or that the friendly face might think she was crazy if she spoke up. One time, her captor was stopped by a police officer at a checkpoint. She tried to signal with her eyes that she was in trouble, but the officer didn't notice the signs of her desperately asking for help. Finally, on the 23rd of August, 2006, she took her chance. Natasha was outside helping her captor vacuum his car when he got a phone call. He was unable to hear the phone over the vacuum noise, so he walked away. Little did the captor know, he forgot to close the front gate. Leaving the vacuum on, Natasha took her chance to run. She sprinted as fast as she could, looking back to check, afraid of him being right behind her. She ran up through a garden to the window of an elderly woman and knocked, startling her. Natasha Kampush was free. Natasha may have been free, but so was her captor. 44-year-old Wolfgang Prikopil's decapitated body was found on train tracks. Shortly after, the police began looking for him. He was one of the first people the police had interviewed upon Natasha's disappearance and had managed to push the whole case back eight years with his alibi that he was home the day of the abduction and he used his van for construction work. 
Had the police further investigated him, they could have prevented eight years of torture and misery for the poor girl. Despite the abuse she endured for eight long years, Natasha felt some sympathy for Wolfgang. She explained that he was trying to live the perfect life that he wanted through her. The man was clearly mentally ill and couldn't cope with regular society. In order for her to survive, she needed to forgive him, and she did. She wasn't saddened by his death, but still made sure to express that she felt bad for him. The police and media were not sympathetic to the young girl, especially when she did not cry and seemed to forgive her captor. According to Natasha, when she was in Vienna's General Hospital for rehabilitation after her traumatic experience, reporters did anything to get photos of her. They would climb up trees or disguise themselves as patients. Pictures of her dungeon littered front pages of newspapers, all of her belongings out in the open as a spectacle, rather than something meant to stay private. Natasha was not ready for her story to be told, yet newspapers were already telling it. But it wasn't really her story. They would add in made-up details that did not happen, and treated her traumatic experience as if it wasn't horrible enough and needed gorier details to be perfect. After she got out of the hospital, she received letters from stalkers who loved her or wanted to kill her. She also received letters from people who offered her jobs at their homes, cooking and cleaning in exchange for board, but she wanted to be free and live in her own apartment. Her reaction was seen as ungrateful, even when all she wanted was to live on her own. Natasha described this eerie feeling as the sympathy extended to a victim is deceptive. People love the victim only when they can feel superior to him or her. Due to the speculations and false accusations of the press, she ended up telling her story only two weeks after her escape, giving interviews to the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, the Kronen Zeitung, and a magazine called News, hoping that the media would leave her alone. Natasha, now 33, lives a normal life in Vienna, Austria. According to her sisters, she seems very happy and active. She enjoys horseback riding and creating jewelry, hobbies that she claims help with her rehabilitation. She also takes singing lessons, which helps her express herself in ways that words cannot. In a twist, Natasha purchased the dreaded house she was held captive in for all those years. She claims it gave her peace, knowing that she is preventing it from becoming a horror theme park for people seeking enjoyment out of her past suffering. Every couple of months, she would drop by and clean the house or deal with any maintenance. Other than her occasional visit, the property remains vacant. In 2006, she had the cellar filled in with concrete to hide the horrors behind. In 2010, Natasha published a book based on her experiences called 3096 Days, which was later made into a movie in 2012 and published under another book in 2016 called 10 Years of Freedom in response to the media attention. There are lots of people who didn't believe that I was captured. They thought I planned it all since I was 10, that I was in on it. It was upsetting, but I tried to hide my emotions. Natasha reflected in a 2016 interview with The Sun. This is one of the many conspiracy theories the public had made up to explain Natasha's eight years of captivity and her forgiveness for Wolfgang Priklopil. Even government officials were convinced Natasha was hiding a CP ring or a second culprit. Despite all that, Natasha chooses to remain strong and not let the criticism get to her. But it is not easy at all when demons are behind. I am thankful. I've had a second chance and I want to do something positive. I am lucky. It is a great gift to share my inner happiness. Thank you.